love to talk about the heart. Heart-to-heart -heart conversations, matters of the heart, having your heart broken, loving with all your heart. We like people who are big-hearted. We don't like people who are heartless. Across the world, we agree. It's all about the heart. But here's the thing. The heart pumps blood. That's what it does. It pumps blood. Now, don't get me wrong. I like the heart. It's a great organ. Some of my best friends have hearts, and pumping blood is incredibly important. The heart should surely win an Academy Award, but the award should be for best supporting actor. Because every time the heart pumps, it supports the true star of the show, the brain. With each beat, the brain goes about its work. It regulates every breath, facilitates every action, enables every thought. Our deepest emotions, memories, and motivations are wrapped up in our neurobiology. Put simply, as we do in the motto of my lab, every story is a brain story. Every single one. Including the story behind my skull. Born and raised in the city of St. Louis, Missouri, there were no attorneys in my family, and I wanted to be the first. So I went to law school, and one of the first things I learned in law school is that law is built on the idea of precedent. The idea of precedent in law means that if we have identical facts, we decide a case in 2020 the same way we decide it based on our 2019 precedent, and 2019 based on 2018 precedent, and 2018 based on 2017, and so on, and so on. The power of the past in the law raises a really challenging question. What if sometime in the intervening years or decades or centuries, we learned something that we didn't know way back then? What if we learned something about the way that we think and feel and act? Well, in medicine, the answer is easy. You don't keep doing what you've been doing. You update your practice. But the law is stubborn. The law is slow. The law doesn't respond the same way. And that's a shame because neuroscience has so much to offer the law. Here's why. Law is in the business of governing human behavior. To do its job well, law must understand why humans do the things they do, think the things they think, and sometimes don't act or think the way we wish they would. Neuroscience can give the law powerful insights into human decision-making and, crucially, can also provide new evidence to help prove or disprove legal claims. So law should be listening to neuroscience because since its founding, law has put a premium on figuring out what's going on inside someone's head. But in practice, integrating neuroscientific insights into the law is not easy. And the reason is that the building blocks of the law were erected at a time when we didn't have an inkling about the brain. Take Aristotle, very smart and very influential on early English law, but he thought the brain was just a cooling device for the blood. So any conversation between neuroscience and law is going to be challenging, and nowhere is this split between ancient legal doctrine and modern neuroscience more pronounced and in the law's insistence on separating the mental from the physical. In law and in society, we treat mental harms and mental illnesses different from physical harms and physical illnesses. We are sympathetic to the persons whose injury puts him in a wheelchair. We are scared of the persons whose injury puts him into fits of yelling. The stigma around mental illness remains. It's not just in society, it's in the law, too. In the law, it is always easier to prove and to be believed about harms that are real, that can be seen. And for the entirety of human history, that meant that mental harms, mental life, were difficult to prove because we didn't have direct access to mental functioning. Neuroscience challenges that. It offers us new evidence, and it challenges law to think differently. A great example of this comes from a case in Michigan. Imagine with me, if you will, a cold, winter day in Michigan and train tracks. Here comes the train, 65 miles per hour, and the crossing guard gate goes down. Ding, 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 ding. The school bus comes up and should stop at the gate, but it doesn't. It swerves around and bang, the train hits the bus. 
Thankfully, there are no children on board, but the school bus driver is very badly injured. Let's turn our attention, however, to Mr. Charles Allen, the conductor of the train. Mr. Allen gets out of the train, he sees this incredibly traumatic episode, and he develops post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. His PTSD is so severe that he can no longer work, and he brings a lawsuit against the school district that owned the bus. This is where it gets interesting. The law in Michigan says he can only go forward with his lawsuit if he has experienced a bodily injury. Remember, he was in the train. He doesn't have a scratch on his body. His arms worked, his legs worked, his shoulders worked, the same as they did before the crash. But his brain, his brain had been injured. And that's exactly what he argued to the court, along with the help of an expert and some brain images. The district court didn't agree with his argument, but the appellate court saw its logic. The brain is a part of the body, PTSD is an injury to the brain, and therefore PTSD, even without a scratch, is a physical, bodily, real injury. Neuroscience is challenging law to revisit many of its questions. Neuroscience is appearing in all sorts of cases. Now, we don't know what effect it's having in all these cases, but we know we're seeing it more and more, and we've even seen it at the level of the United States Supreme Court. Such was the case with Terrence Jamar Graham. Terrence Graham was 16 years old when he and some friends attempted to rob a barbecue restaurant. It didn't go well, and he received probation. Several months later, however, he violated that probation when he and some other friends attempted to rob a home with a loaded weapon. Because it was a probation violation and because of some previous offenses, Terrence Graham received the worst sentence. Not 10 years, not 20 years, not 30 years, not 40 years, but life without the possibility of parole. The judge looks at 16-year-old Terrence Graham and said, I don't know why you would throw your life away. There's nothing more we can do for you. This is the way you are going to lead your life. And with that, 16-year-old Terrence Graham would never see life outside a prison wall again. But he challenged his sentence under the U.S. Constitution's Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Graham wasn't the first to make such an argument, but his case was unique because he invoked neuroscience. And Justice Kennedy took notice. Writing for the majority, Justice Kennedy wrote that developments in psychology and brain science continued to show significant differences between adolescent and adult brains. The justice recognized that Terrence Graham's story was a brain story and, crucially, that his brain story could change. Today, across the country, juvenile justice practitioners regularly cite to brain science and they're pushing the law even further, saying don't just look at 16 to 18-year-olds, but emerging adults as well, 18 through 25, because that's where the science is taking us. Now, let's be clear. Neuroscience is not a get-out-of-jail free card, and not every use of neuroscience in the law is productive. Inappropriate and premature uses of brain science in courts can cause big problems for the law. For example, there have been multiple cases where attorneys have wanted to introduce the jury to brain-based lie detection evidence. To stand before you and say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my client is telling the truth and I have the brain scans to prove it. Judges in those cases have to make the difficult decision, should they let the jury see this evidence? Thankfully, they have excluded that evidence because the science just isn't there yet. Just think for a moment about where we're at. Courts, not just movies and TV shows, but real courts are having to deal with brain-based lie detection evidence. The science is moving really fast. And it's precisely because the science is moving fast that it can be hard to figure out where that line is between science and science fiction, and harder still to know, even with good science, how to integrate it into legal doctrine. But I can tell you that in my work and the work of our colleagues, we're making real progress. Insights from neuroscience are now being used to help judges make more efficient and effective criminal sentences. Insights from the neuroscience of memory are changing the ways that courts handle eyewitness testimony in important cases. 
Insights from the neuroscience of aging are helping courts and policymakers better protect older adults from financial fraud. And across a wide swath of policy and law, insights from neuroscience are improving the ways that we respond to those facing addiction and other mental disorders. So a lot is happening, but a lot more will happen in the future. We are really only at the dawn of the law and neuroscience revolution. In my lifetime, we will see portable brain scanners. We'll see the advent of brain health checkups, and we will see more and more neurotechnology, both wearable and implantable. The developments of these technologies will require careful attention to their ethical, legal, and social implications. But if developed responsibly, these technologies and developments in artificial intelligence and genetics will push us forward, will help us unpack and better decode brain circuitry. For medicine, this will lead to many new cures and advances in care. But what will it all mean for the law? I think in many ways, a good analogy is to instant replay in professional sports. We know now that instant replay has fundamentally changed the game, even though it's only used in a small sliver of cases. When do we turn to instant replay? When the stakes are high, was it a touchdown or not? When someone's toe is just on the line, was she out of bounds? When we disagree with the referee's call, and crucially, when we actually have a good image to use. It wasn't that long ago when there was no instant replay. That's when the umpire referee made a call, no appeal was possible, but no longer. And just as there are moments in the stadium where everyone knows we're going to go look to the replay booth, there will be moments in courts when everyone knows we ought to look at brain science. Not in every case, but in the important cases, the cases that challenge that old doctrine, those frameworks, those old assumptions. Instant replay didn't come to professional sports all at once, and it will take time for neuroscience to enter the law as well. But there is a lot of momentum. In just the past 10 years, there have been thousands of cases citing to brain evidence. There have been thousands of new patents around neurotechnology, and thousands of judges and attorneys have come to workshops just to learn about the brain. Never before in the law has this happened. So something is afoot. The changes right now are small. But in those small changes are the seeds of something much, much greater. And eventually, neuroscience will challenge us not to think of how the law is now, but how the law can be. Neuroscience will challenge the law's most fundamental assumptions. And at the core of that neuroscience challenge will be a simple yet powerful proposition that in the law and in our lives, every story is a brain story. Thank you.